Let's let's pray. Heavenly Father, we we do pray now that uh, the words of that hymn may be true, that uh, you may breathe on us with your Holy Spirit fire and give us just uh, illumination, understanding from your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, the, the human mind is capable of great brilliance. It can compose beautiful music. Think of Mozart, Mendelssohn and McCartney. It can write great literature. Think of Shakespeare, Dickens and Austin. It can reproduce great drama. Think of Olivier Guinness, Alec Guinness, remember him, and Dench. It can advance the medical sciences. It can advance the engineering and technological sciences. It can put a man on the moon and bring him safely back to Earth. But of course, as we know from recent history as well as from today's world, the human mind can also be capable of great evil. Think of Hitler, Stalin, and dare I say, Putin. Now, today, surgeons can carry out all manner of transplants of the human body's vital organs, of the liver, of the kidney, and of the heart. But no one has ever been able to carry out a transplant of the human mind. But this is what Paul is referring to at the end of verse 16 of this morning's reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. A transplant of the mind. But we have the mind of Christ, writes Paul. The word Paul uses twice in in verse 16 and is translated as mind is the Greek word noose, noose. It's where we get our word in English, nous, from. And nous in ancient Greek is the human mind, its understanding, its reasoning, its way of thinking. And now Paul claims to have the nous of Christ. What a statement to make. For Paul to have the mind of Christ We know if we're well acquainted with the New Testament that this was not always the case. He did not always possess it. When we first meet Paul in Acts, he had the darkened mind of a religious zealot. He had the mind of someone hostile to Christ. He had the mind of someone determined to wipe out the church of Jesus Christ. So for Paul to now state that he has the mind of Christ, a mind transplant must have taken place. He had acquired a new mind. He had been renewed in mind so he could make the bold assertion that he, among others, had the mind of Christ. John Stott once wrote a book for Christians entitled Your Mind Matters. And of course, he was absolutely right. The Christian's mind does matter. And it's the reason why the Christian, once he or she has received Jesus Christ, also gets a new mind, the development of the mind of Christ through the inward work of the Holy Spirit. Well, let's, let's quickly recap to how we have reached this point in Paul's argument. And two weeks ago, we saw how Paul preached a message of God's wisdom in Corinth some three to five years earlier. The wisdom of God is the salvation which is realized through the cross of Christ. And God's wisdom of Christ crucified was not his plan B when mankind rebelled, but actually was his plan A from the beginning, before the beginning of time. And the purpose of God's wisdom was for the Christian to share in God's glory. But to the rulers of the ages, it was unintelligible. God's wisdom was a mystery they could not grasp. God's wisdom is only imparted through God's spirit. The Holy Spirit is the sole channel through which the Christian is enlightened by God's wisdom. 
And without the work of the Holy Spirit, the greatest of human minds remain in spiritual darkness. But with the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit, the work of transplanting begins and the Christian gradually acquires the mind of Christ. I'd like us to follow Paul's argument from verses 10 to 16 under three headings and then conclude with a, a few points of application. And firstly, Paul uses as uh, an analogy in verse 11, he uses the analogy of the human mind, the human mind. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now it's true. Some of us, more than others, wear our hearts on our sleeves. Our, our body language, to a certain extent, gives away how we are feeling and what we are thinking at a particular time. Others of us have a poker face. Our body language or our facial expressions don't give away at all our thoughts or our feelings. In 1970, there was a song in the charts with these words. If I could read your mind, love, what a tale your thoughts could tell. And the, the sentiment of the song is right. If I could read your mind, love. In reality, we can't often accurately read another person's mind. Their thoughts remain private to them. No one really knows what we are thinking except when we disclose those thoughts to someone close to us. In fact, one of the marks of growing love and trust in our relationships is when we are prepared to reveal more and more of our inner thoughts to others. But unless we choose to divulge them, they remain hidden. That is, hidden to everyone except God, who, according to the psalmist David, perceived his thoughts from afar. Do you remember Psalm 139? So it's part of being human, isn't it? To have our own internal world of the mind. And in this, there is a parallel with God, writes Paul. Only God knows his own mind. Only God knows his own thoughts. But the God of the Christian faith is a triune God, a God of three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And these verses 10 through 16 are Trinitarian in nature. The Holy Spirit, argues Paul in verse 10, has explored the depths of God's mind. He's examined the deepest recesses of the mind of God. There is absolutely nothing the Holy Spirit has not fathomed about God. And Paul references the prophet Isaiah in verse 16. What person, writes Paul, has ever got to grips with the mind of Yahweh the Lord in order to be in a position to give him instruction? Absolutely no one. The very notion anyone possibly could is unthinkable. But, writes Paul, we have the mind of Christ which in the context of verse 16 is a reference to the unity of the Father and of his Son, Jesus Christ. The mind of Christ perfectly reflects the mind of God the Father and it grows in the Christian through the ministry of the Holy Spirit indwelling him or her. So Paul uses this analogy of the human mind just as someone really only knows what he or she is really thinking all the time. It's the same with God, the Father, who is Father, Son, and Spirit. Thus to know God's ways, his values, and his thoughts, and to develop the mind of Christ, we need God's Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit, part of the, the Godhead, to enter into us. The human mind. 
But secondly, Paul describes in verse 14 what I've called the, the natural mind. The person without the spirit does it not accept the things that come from the spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the spirit. The natural mind is what the, the church Bible calls the person without the spirit. The revised standard version describes the, this natural mind as the unspiritual man. So the, the man or woman with the natural mind is the unbeliever. He or she is not a Christian. Their minds are still in a fallen condition. They have not been enlightened by the Holy Spirit. They had the minds they were born with naturally alienated from God. And what is the outcome of this? Well, the natural mind cannot make head nor tail of the things which come from the Holy Spirit, because these things are discerned through the very spirit which the natural mind lacks. The natural mind cannot appreciate the spiritual things engendered by the Holy Spirit. To the natural mind, they're gibberish, and unfathomable. Let me give you some parallels from everyday life. The person who is tone deaf cannot appreciate the heart stirring music when an orchestra plays Pachelbel's Canon in D major or Elgar's Nimrod. The person who is color blind cannot appreciate the spectacular autumn colours of the New England countryside. The person who does not speak Greek is a, a complete loss in a theatre where a play is conducted in the Greek language. It's literally all Greek to him. The natural mind, as we've already thought about, is capable of brilliance. It can master complex mathematics. It's able to, to, to write profound poetry. It's able to create great art. It's able to compose moving music. But the natural mind cannot receive spiritual things. It cannot perceive spiritual realities. The natural mind is severely limited spiritually. The natural mind is hamstrung spiritually. The natural mind lives by what it sees. It does not see beyond this world. It does not see beyond this life. I came across these few lines which sum up quite well the natural state of the mind. Into this world to eat and to sleep and to know no reason why he was born, save to consume the corn, devour the cattle, flock and fish, and leave behind an empty dish. That's the natural mind in spiritual ignorance. Of course, on occasions, the, the, the natural mind does have deep reflections. When I was in secular work, I had a, a colleague and he would often ruminate with me about life and its finite nature. Kevin, he would say to me, <coughs> we are only visitors. We're only visitors. We're only visitors on this planet. Excuse me. He saw how quickly life was slipping by. He'd recently lost his father. His children were now adults. And he'd lost that innocent of youth. When you think that life goes on forever and aging is only something that happens to old people. But he could not see beyond this world. Spiritual realities were for him too far fetched, too fanciful, and too fantastic to seriously contemplate. <clears throat> His sense of reality was limited to the here and now, to the daily grind of life, and to what he saw on the late evening news. And that's typical of the natural mind. It lives entirely on the material plane by what it sees, feels, hears, smells and tastes. 
The natural mind inhabits only the material world. It's untouched by the Spirit of God. It dismisses the things of the Spirit. It pushes them away as implausible. The Christian to the person with the natural mind is somewhat of an oddity, an enigma. He sees, he, he or she sees the Christian going to church but fails to see the attraction, the singing of old hymns, the praying to an unseen God, the preaching from a dusty old book, the Bible. Well, they seem to be absurd things to be engaged in. They're anachronistic relics of a bygone age. Why would anyone in Britain bother in the 2020s? That is the natural mind. It doesn't have the bandwidth to embrace spiritual things. It's on a different wavelength and is unable to receive the things of the Holy Spirit. Well, that brings us thirdly to the spiritual mind, verses 12, 13, and 15. You know, sometimes you will, you will hear people refer to themselves as being spiritual, but not religious. But such a, an expression has to be debunked. And what they really mean by this is, I'm open to the possibility there is more to life than the rat race, to the monthly pressure of making ends meet, of providing for myself and my family. But I don't go to church and I've rejected religion in any organized sense. I'm pursuing my own path for meaning. I'm trying to make my own sense of what life is all about. But the person with this mindset although claiming to be spiritual, in fact, is not spiritual at all in the eyes of Paul and the New Testament. The spiritual person is the person in whom the Holy Spirit dwells. The spiritual person with the spiritual mind is the Christian. See what Paul writes to the Romans. Romans 8 verse 9. You, however are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. You are a Christian if the spirit of God lives in you. There is no other definition of spirituality according to the New Testament. The natural mind, therefore, just operates in one realm, the physical world, but the spiritual mind operates in two realms, the physical world and the spiritual world. The spiritual mind perceives two realities, the realities of this life and the reality of the spiritual life. And what is it that enables this recognition? What is it that sets the Christian apart from the non-Christian? Well, the Christian has received the Spirit who is from God, the Holy Spirit, verse 12. It's the Holy Spirit which differentiates the Christian believer from the unbeliever. It allows the spiritual mind to understand, verse 12, what God has freely given. Now, what are the signs that someone is soundly converted and that the Holy Spirit is active in them? Well, it's back to verse 12. It's the acknowledgement of what they've been freely given, that they've been saved by grace, that salvation is not something they've earned nor deserved by their own efforts. No, salvation is what God has freely given to them. And what is more, when Paul came to Corinth a few years earlier, he did not use words based on human wisdom, verse 13, but spoke instead words taught to him by the Holy Spirit. And as the Holy Spirit was at work in the hearts of the Corinthians, Paul's words became accessible to them and they were able to grasp what he said. He transmitted spiritual truths to those who were spiritual, i.e. to those Corinthians who believed, who received Christ and who were indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The Christian then is the one with the spiritual mind. It's not the one who has some vague sense of spirituality and of a, a hazy sense that there must be some higher purpose to life on earth. 
What does the spiritual mind enable the Christian to do? Well, we see the answer, don't we, in verse 15. The person with the spirit makes judgments about all things. The Holy Spirit, in conjunction with the word of God, is able to empower the Christian to see the world as Christ sees the world. The spiritual mind begins to see the world from God's perspective and it makes its judgments accordingly. The spiritual mind knows right from wrong, truth from error and wisdom from folly. The spiritual mind is certainly not infallible, but if, but if it's diligently engaging with God's word and has the Holy Spirit as its teacher, its discernment becomes ever more finely tuned. Moreover, that the spiritual mind is, is able to withstand the pressure from modern culture, which defines as acceptable those things God's word says is sinful. In a post-Christian culture, the spiritual mind is still able to think Christianly, if there is such an adverb. It realises that although governments can pass laws to make a sin legal, there are none which can be passed to make it moral. The spiritual mind does not conform to the pattern of this world. It thinks differently. It thinks with the mind of Christ. So Paul uses the, the human mind as an illustration to make his point. People have an internal world of the mind. They have thoughts so private, so personal, so, and so intimate. No one knows them apart from themselves. And these thoughts, thoughts stay within the boundaries of their own internal space. And so it is with God. He's inscrutable. He's unfathomable. Who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? It's certainly impossible for the natural mind. Without the aid of the Holy Spirit, the things of God and the things of the Spirit of God are impenetrable. It is only the spiritual mind, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, which has the right frequency to receive the things of the Spirit of God. How can we make Paul's teaching practical for ourselves? I've got two pieces of application. Firstly, we need to understand that the unbeliever has no jurisdiction over the Christian in spiritual matters. I think this is what Paul means in the second half of verse 15. But such a person, that is a, a Christian, someone in whom the Holy Spirit dwells, is not subject to merely human judgments. Now, the, the Christian, let's get this clear, is certainly subject to his fellow man's judgments in secular matters. If on my way to church, a speeding camera records that I've broken the speed limit and I receive a fine and a three-point penalty penalties on my, my license. It's no good me pleading that I was on the Lord's business and I'd feared I'd be late for a preaching engagement. No, in this case, I am subject to human judgments. I broke the law and therefore I must pay the fine. But if a Christian is criticised for simply living out his faith and pursuing his calling, any criticism which comes his way from the secular world has no authority over him. It may wound him, and the Christian, but the Christian is not subject to it. He can politely ignore it. He is liberated from living under other people's judgment. David Jackman, the church minister, Bible teacher and commentator, recalled how in the 1960s, before he began in Christian ministry, he was in education, teaching mass at a prestigious school in Portsmouth. 
But after a few years of, of teaching, he felt the call to go into full-time Christian service with the InterVarsity Fellowship and work with university students in Christian unions. His headmaster at Portsmouth Grammar School was not impressed, however. And he told David Jackman in no uncertain times, terms he was acting foolishly and was throwing away a promising career. The, teach, the head teacher warned him not to come back, asking for his job in six months' time when he realised that he had made an error of judgement. But David Jackman was not deterred. His headmaster was expressing his worldly but un spiritual judgment however as a Christian he was not subject to it and nor did he ever return cap in hand to ask for his old job back the non-Christian has no jurisdiction over the Christian in spiritual matters but secondly but secondly the Christian mind must be nurtured on conversion, the Christian receives the Holy Spirit, and in that sense, the transplant of the mind of Christ has taken place. The Christian has the mind of Christ, but the Christian mind must be developed. It must be nurtured. It must be cultivated. It must be brought into maturity. And this was the problem with the Corinthians, as we shall go on to see next week. They had the mind of Christ, but they were acting like children in Christ. Look what Paul writes in chapter 3, verse 1. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. It was perhaps as many as five years on since they had been converted, but the Corinthian Christians had not matured as believers. They were still spiritual babies they were thinking and acting like children the christian mind therefore has to be nurtured be transformed writes paul to the romans by the renewing of your mind the transplant is a completed action the renewal of the mind is a process in one sense, the, the Christian has the mind of Christ, but in another sense, the Christian acquires the mind of Christ. The Christian appropriates the mind of Christ over a lifetime. And it does not come without effort. It does not come without applying yourself. It means having regular personal devotions, praying and reading the Bible on your own. It means reading good Christian books. It means listening to God's word faithfully preached. William Lyon Phelps was an American educationist who devoted himself to training the mind. He warned this about, about this he said that at a certain age some people's minds close up they live on their intellectual fat that can often be true of christians can't it they stop reading their bibles they have quiet times only sporadically they switch off during the sermon at church they live off what they have heard in the past they live off stale bread and not fresh bread they have no fresh appetite for god's word and as a consequence the growth of the christian mind within them is stunted its development is arrested and the christian becomes impoverished when paul wrote but we have the mind of christ it was on the assumption that the mind of christ had to be nurtured, otherwise spiritual babies do not grow up. They remain, like the Corinthians were, mere infants in Christ. So if you belong to Jesus Christ this morning, you no longer possess a natural mind, you have a spiritual mind. You've been the recipient, the beneficiary of a mind transplant. You have the mind of Christ. 
the natural mind, the natural man, well, he walks by sight, but he sees nothing beyond this world. He's spiritually blind. But the spiritual man, the Christian, over time grows in discernment and understands more of the mind and of the will of God. To have the mind of Christ is to view life from the Saviour's perspective, gradually appropriating his values and desires. It's to think as Christ thinks and not as this world thinks. So we make our closing hymn also our prayer. May the mind of Christ my Saviour live in me from day to day by his love and power controlling all I do and say. Amen.